Why did Noah ever go fishing? He only had two worms. Come on, okay. Fishermen just get that. Okay. How long did uh, Cain hate his brother? As long as he was able to. Who was the smartest man in the Bible? Abraham. He knew a lot. What kind of person was Boaz before he got married? Ruthless. <laughs> Who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson. Yeah. Well, he brought down the house. Um, which servant of God was the worst lawbreaker in the Bible? Moses. He broke all Ten Commandments at once. Okay. At what time of the day was Adam created? A little before Eve. Um, which Bible character has no parents? Joshua, son of Nun. So we thought it was Adam, didn't we? It was Joshua, the son of Nun. What animal? What animal could Noah not trust? Cheetah. Who was the straightest man in the Bible? Joseph. Pharaoh made him a ruler. Who is the biblical character who likes to drink soft drinks? Hepatoc. <laughs> Where is the first mention of laxatives in the Bible? In Exodus, the part when Moses took the tablets and went into the wilderness. <laughs> now, those who are biblical scholars know that God told them that if they have to defecate, they have to take a small scoop, go into the wilderness, do their business, and come back. Well, he took the tablets with them. And he took the tablets and he went in the wilderness. That's good. I like that. I had to end it with that. You have to. Okay, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, in presence of all these witnesses, to hear your word. And we know that your word uh, runs true in everything. And we thank you for today as I look into our wilderness, wilderness is the same wilderness that Jesus went through, that his lesson can teach us to be like him and more like him. We thank you that you are, you'll be with us today. I, I pray your Blessing on us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We begin in the first event of Jesus' ministry, his baptism by John. Let us turn and read together Matthew 3, verse 13. And I'm reading from the God's, God's Word Bible translation. Then Jesus appeared. I'm sorry. He came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? Jesus answered him, This is the way it has to be now. It has to be now. This is the proper way to do everything that God requires of us. And John gave it to him after, after Jesus was baptized. He immediately came up from the water. Suddenly the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down as a dove to him. Then a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, my Son, whom I am pleased, with whom I am pleased. The significance of our Lord being baptized by John is because it marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry and affirms his identity as the Son of God to John, his disciples, and all the witnesses around them. Also, the, in, also importantly, the Trinity is dramatically portrayed <clears throat> at the same time in each of the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As the sun was coming up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and the voice of God exclaimed, This is my Son, whom I love. My, I'm a son, my Son, whom, with whom I am pleased. We see from the text that John hesitates when Jesus requests baptism. Why? Because John's is a baptism of repentance. He knows Jesus has nothing to repent of. John's baptism, is, but Jesus answered him, this is the way it has to be. This is the proper way to do everything that God requires of us. John then acted, did, in an act of obedience, obeyed. Christ not only commands believers to get baptized, baptism is also a gift. He graciously gives it for our benefit and blessing. 
There are three reasons to be baptized. One, to obey Christ's command. Two, to, pub to publicly profess faith in Christ. Three, to finally commit yourself to Christ and his people. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The wilderness is a desolate area located in Judea, south of Jerusalem, west of the Jordan River, including the Dead Sea, approximately 27 miles long, and, and drains about 89 square miles or 230 square kilometers. It's a very rocky, hilly, uh, desolate, void of vegetation, very hot and arid area. Um, we, when Karen and I were in Israel, we went through the wilderness. I just could not get over how anybody could even last 40 days. Or he had nothing to eat. There was nothing, not to believe your ass. And uh, some parts of the wilderness on the fringes, there are, there are sparse grasses, but in the place where the deep crevices are, when they get flash floods in, in, uh, in that limestone area in Judea, and uh, these floods dig these deep crevices, and these hills are extremely rocky and jagged. You just can't get any more desolate in, in your mind's eye. Anyone that's looking on the internet, just type in the wilderness in Judea, and it's, uh, it's amazing to look at, to see how desolate it is. Um, the three temptations by Satan in, Satan in the wilderness were not only temptations of our Lord, are, are, not, are not only the te temptations of our Lord ever suffered on earth. We read in Luke 4, 2, that he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, but he was undoubtedly tempted at other times. I, I believe because Satan knew who Jesus was, he was tempted more than all of us in the room put together. Uh, we can't even fathom to think, you know, how we are tempted every day by our eyes, by our, our nose, by all our senses. Jesus had it that much sharper. He was tempted more than we were, yet he remained pure. Um, in Luke 4, 13, uh, it says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed with him until an opportune time. So it just always says that, that, that tells us that, that um, Jesus was under constant um, uh, temptation. And again, at the end in Matthew 16, 21, 3, from the time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chiefs, priests, and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, He, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. See, he saw Satan. He had, uh, Peter was tempted to go to, <laughs> go to uh, Jesus' uh, rescue, but no, he said, get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then Luke twenty two forty two, 42, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that's that's the example of the, the height of temptation that we can't even get our heads around. He was in that garden praying for everything, and uh, he sweat beads of, of blood because he was tempted to say, take this cup away from me. Take, but he knew it's his will, not my will. Let us turn to Luke 4, chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they, ended, when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him, all the kingdoms of the world at you know, a time, in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I give this authority, all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship your God, your, 
you worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command angels concerning you to guard you. And on their, their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, Jesus answered again, answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until, until an opportune time. It's the second time that is quoted. It's Jesus always, is always under attack, just like we are. But God protects us more than <coughs> Jesus. Jesus was God, so he, he could help. He would have great help to resist the Satan. Um, let us analyze the scripture we just read. In verse 4, And Jesus, full and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. This here is a testimony of the Son of God at the very beginning of his ministry, being filled with the Holy Spirit by, by God, stepping out into his wilderness experience, led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible always leads by example. Jesus here is our example or our blueprint. The born-again believer, too, must be filled by the Holy Spirit and in perfect communication with to face his or her day wildernesses being tempted by the devil. How else can anyone survive without succumbing Satan's lies, sins of the world, and sins of the flesh? We all know what happens when we go unprepared. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, and he ate nothing for those days. And when they were, they were ended, he was hungry. This was the target of uh, Satan's first temptation. Satan suggested that Jesus should use his divine power to satisfy his physical body hunger. Jesus quoted a phrase from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. It says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And since Satan knew scripture, he had no argument. In this account of the temptation of Jesus, we see him going out into the wilderness to be tempted as a man. Therefore, his temptations are our, our temptations. That is why this account is so intriguing, so gripping, so practical for us, because this is exactly the form of temptation we are continually facing day after day. Jesus shows us the secret of how Jesus met it. Therefore, we shall know how to meet temptation in our own lives. The first is that temptation does not come to us because we are sinners. It comes to us because we are human beings. It was not a sinner that Jesus, it was not as a sinner that Jesus was tempted. And our being sinners does not add anything to the force of temptation. And our being sinners does not add anything, oh, I said that. <laughs> he felt the full effect of it simply because he was a man. It is our humanity that makes us subject to the power of temptation. Since claims the tempter, you are the son of God, why not do this or do that? The whole thrust of the temptation of the devil here is to get the Lord Jesus to move away from the principle of dependence and trust in the indwelling Father. This is always the principle of temptation with us as well. The devil attempts to get us to act out on our own and independently of God. That is the nature of all temptation. I'll take God out of the picture. Um, one other fact, we are told that when Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted, he was driven into a wilderness. This may sound a bit odd to us. The first temptation of man was in a garden. But this temptation of the second man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, occurs in a wilderness. Normally we do not think of a wilderness as a place of temptation. If we want to avoid some of the problems of the temptations of life, we choose to run away or get out of the rat race and flee, flee to a wilderness. This is where the hermits have always gone, attempting to escape the world, thinking to find relief from the temptation in the wilderness. We think of the city as a place of temptation, 
If you want to put a young man or woman under pressure and send them to the city, that is where they'll, get, they'll be exposed to the whole power and allurement of evil. But this account comes to but this account comes to correct our false impressions and show us that temptation does not come from without, but from within. It is not the outside force that creates temptation or in outward circumstances or situations, but temptation arises from within. Jesus said, it is not what goes into a man, but what comes out from within that, defi that defiles him. This strikes at a very common misconception we all have. We think that our fa failures or faults or follies are due to certain outward pressure, outward pressures. If you listen to people talking, you can hear someone explain, why did, why did such and such, why did he do such and such? He will say, well, there was nothing else I could do under the circumstances. Or we say, he or she talked me into it. Or he, or I simply got carried away. Or I wasn't, I, it wasn't I who was at fault. You see, it was just that the pressures of the situation were of such a nature I could not resist. I was carried away with it. To blame another one or any circumstances is, is not, not yourself. That's victim mentality. As Jesus says, it's not our circumstances, but our weaknesses within. Some allurement to which we yield to, some inner urge, Jesus therefore was driven into a solitary wilderness to experience the full force of human temptation, to show us that it comes from within. <clears throat> In this first temptation, the tempter came and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. I think we'll never understand the power of that upon Jesus unless we understand he was had been going without food for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't think any of us have been in a position to understand what that word bread must have meant to him. I know I've, uh, with my diet, I've, um, I've fasted momentarily. I generally uh, fast about 12 to 16 hours a day, mostly 12 hours a day, but uh, I tried to do it. Uh, I did it for two and a half days one day, one time, but that was the longest. 40 days is beyond me. So I can imagine just the, the sound of this, of, of the word bread made him drool from the urge, urge that urge to satisfy, satisfy his need. This is an, is indicative, this is an indica, an, an indicative and important to note, indicative and important to note that this temptation rose out, arose out of a normal natural need, out of his basic humanity. <coughs> It isn't something wrong with him that caused his temptation, but simply that he was a human being. Temptations come to us in the same way. Now notice particularly the force of, his, of this temptation to him. What the devil really was saying to Jesus, look, God doesn't really care for you, does he? If, he, if you were the son of God, he would... Would he, would he leave you in a wilderness without food for 40 days and 40 nights? Surely he has made some way of providing for your need to be met, if he loves you. So why don't you act upon your innate powers of deity and turn these stones into bread, if you are the Son of God? The suggestion is that God is either too busy at the moment, too unconcerned, or too something to take care of him. There is a subtle pressure here to act Upon, upon his own independent of the Father, on the basis that, that after all human life is important, after all he has got to live, the devil's attempt is to reverse the priorities of life and make the physical life the most important thing of all. The tempter hopes to have us all believe the lie that physical life is the most important thing, and that if God doesn't take adequate care of us, it is proof that he doesn't love us. Who has heard, who hasn't heard that temptation? You hear it in those who point to the injustices of life, who say, if God is a loving God, as you Christians say, what about these disabled people? How come he allows death, war, disappointment, tragedies? If God, if God is a God of love, 
Does he not take care of his own? This is the force of temptation of our Lord. And the power of temptation millions of people face today, perhaps many right here. Now, see how the Lord answers. The devil's work is always to twist and distort things and make them look different than they are. And particularly twist our attitudes so that we see life out of proportion. But our Lord immediately returns to the proper perspective of life, puts things back on a right basis and focus by quoting his word, Deuteronomy 8, 3, it is written, a man shall not live by bread alone. That is, the deepest need of human life is not the physical. It never was, never will be. Man is more than an animal, more than simply an animated piece of beefsteak, a hunk of meat with a nervous system whose principal need is physical supply. Man shall not live by bread alone. Our Lord is saying, it is better to die of hunger in a wilderness in a right relationship to God who made us and to satisfy it at a cost of that relationship. He said other things about that, you know, it's better to have one eye than two eyes, or it's better to have one arm. Um, anyways, that's a... Um, our Lord's sitting is better to die of hunger in a wilderness and in a right relationship with, to the God who made us than to satisfy it at the cost of that relationship. With that trust, he ended the first temptation, putting life back into focus, reminding us that we have a deeper needs than physical, and that the temporary lack of physical supply does not in any way indicate that God, that the God who made us and who is deeply concerned in all areas of our lives has forgotten us or is unconcerned. He is always in control. The devil then switched, back, switched his plan of attack drawing him to a high place and showed Jesus a vision of all the kingdoms of the earth. He promised all of this all of this power to Christ if he would just bow down and worship him. But Christ said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now look at the second temptation. The first was on the level of Jesus' human physical needs of his hunger. This, this is directed at the level of his soul. The devil took Jesus into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle, the top of the temple, and said to him, in Matthew 4, 6, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. And he pulls out his trump card, no pun intended, um, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Look at this, it's most interesting. The first temptation was aimed at <clears throat> our Lord's weakness as a man. His basic need for physical sustenance, his hunger. The devil cruelly tried to exploit that weakness and make him violate the, his most important relations, trust in the Father. Now this is a typically vile move to exactly the extreme opposite. The devil is saying, you trust in God, do you? I tried to get you to move apart from that trust. I see you really do trust him. Well, that's great. Best you, best thing you could ever do. Now I offer you, now I offer how you can manifest that trust. If you really want to show how much trust you, how much trust you have in God, put yourself in a place of deadly danger. Cast yourself from the top of this temple, and then everyone that everyone will see that your trust in God is unsha so unshakable that you dare put yourself in any dangerous circumstance. And remember, it is written, He will give His angels charge over you. He will hold you up, keep you in all your ways. The devil's tactics are always the same. If he can't push you off on this side, he'll push you off on the other. It doesn't matter to him which one. This is why we so often find ourselves teetering from one extreme to the other. If someone has grown up without moral standards, learning to live in lust and self-expression, but when they become a Christian, it often happens they switch to the opposite extreme and plunge into being a prude of the most annoying sort. They begin to act as if there's something basically evil about sex. It also happens if one 
has been reared according to a strict moral standards, then oftentimes when they come into manhood or womanhood, there is a temptation to rebel and throw away all the standards, throw out the rule book and live as you like. This we commonly see when we, they go away to college. And it simply is the ancient tactic of the devil, that when we resist him in one area, he quickly tries to get us to act in the extreme opposite. It is all more powerful, of course, when he, if he, when he supports it with scripture. Here he quotes Psalm 91, who says, and says, You trusted God, wonderful. Use your trust now to the full. And remember, you have scripture for it. The angels will bear, up, bear you up in their hands. What, what do you say to that? Have you ever felt the force of that temptation? Has anyone said, look, I can show you from the scriptures that you can do so and so and do that, this and that. And you say, how can I argue? After all, the Bible says so. And here are all the, and here are all those many arguments based on that claim. The Bible says so. It is, it is said you can prove almost anything in the Bible. If you take it, anything, anything out of it when you take things out of context. That is true. If you read it the twisted way the devil does, you, we, will, we shall see more than in our Lord's answer. But notice the potential of that temptation. The devil is saying, look, you want to demonstrate trust in God. This is the way to do it. If you really would like to show people how thoroughly you trust God, here's the peak of the temple. There they are waiting all below the whole crowd. Jump off of it. And you will demonstrate how fully God is with you, and you are, and you are a man of God. This reveals one, one of the most common misconceptions, especially as Christians, the idea that the greatest display of faith in some spectacular dem the greatest display of faith is some spectacular demonstration. You hear this from philosophy from healers, those who speak in tongues, uh, snake handlers all those who are looking for miracles. They, they are saying, if you really want to show faith in God, you have to do some kind of miracle. The mark of a man of faith is that he is able to do something supernatural. He can do dangerous things, pick up snakes, speak, speak in tongues, drink poison, heal the sick, raise the dead. Aha, this is the man, this is the mark of a man of faith. Yeah. But our Lord, but our Lord puts life back in perspective when he's reveals the truth. He says, again it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The greatest display of faith is not some spectacle, but the quiet trust of the, of the heart that rests upon God, what God has said, not just what he said in one place, but balanced truth. The most important in the word, in the, the most important word of the whole, of the whole scriptures, in many respect, is the one he adds, it is written. Truth it does not come to us in capsule form. It's a complete account, and one <coughs> truth needs to be balanced against another truth. This is, of course, the answer to all the cults, the isms and the esms and the spasms, who rest upon one scripture quoted from this book and one from another. They can produce impressive volumes filled with many cherry-picked quotations from scripture to bolster their arguments and support their truth, the answer is always in it is written. Well, there's one further thing, if, if one, there is one further thing in this account. If we are under temptation to demonstrate faith by some spectacular display, we must ask ourselves the question, why do you want this power in your life? To what purpose? What do you want to use it for? Now let's look at the third temptation. Matthew 4, 9 to 11, as we read before, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to them, all of these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you should, written you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now the devil moves to the essential basic part of to the essential basic part of human life, the realm of the spirit, and comes about with a direct appeal 
to the deepest desire in the heart of mankind placed there by God, that his life might be worthwhile, that he might do something of value and make his unforgettable mark in this world. Who doesn't want his life to be worthwhile? Who does not want to, who is not, who does not fear wasting his life and immediately forgotten? Who does not want to be remembered and feel that he's done something eminently worthwhile? That is simply basic to our humanity. The devil quickly picks this up. In a moment of time, in his last ditch effort, taking Jesus to a high mountain, and, some, and in some wonderful way shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. In some sense, Jesus saw all the kingdom, kingdoms of earth and their glory. All that has attracted human hearts, causing men and women to sometimes leave their families and possessions in order to win the power and place in place of exaltation and authority of such kingdoms. And the devil said to him, you can have all this if you fall down and worship me. Now think of that, for these kingdoms were exactly what Jesus Christ had come to this earth to get. He came in order to win the world, that he might be Lord of all, that he might be exalted as, as man to the highest position in the universe, that every tongue should confess, every knee should bow, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. This is why he came. Now the devil is offering it to him. The devil only showed it to him in a moment of time, just a quick glimpse, almost as though afraid to let the Lord look at it very long that he might see the worthlessness of it. The fact that all of this is only an illusion, an illusion, a sparkling, shimmering babble, a bauble. It, it looks very solid, dependable, alluring, and significant, but when grasped, it just becomes a blob of dirty cobwebs. But, but, there it is again. You notice how Jesus immediately sees through it. His reply is almost contemptuous. Be gone, Satan. Get thee behind me. The truth is that you shall worship your Lord, your God. You shall worship the Lord, your God, and him only shall you serve. Notice the combination of words here. Worship and serve. To worship is to serve. To serve is to worship. And only God can give value of life to you, Satan, that, that you, and only God can give the value to life that you, Satan, are suggesting. The kingdoms and the kingdoms and glory of the world will never give it. What you are striking at is a deepest desire of a person's life to have a life that is worthwhile. Only God can do that. Therefore, you shall worship and serve your God, only the Lord your God. And immediately the devil left him, and the angels came to minister, minister to him. Now it is important to notice as our Lord meets these temptations in, in the physical soul and spirit, each time he used the same weapon. It is the same weapon available to all of us. He's referred to me, he referred immediately to the word of God. He didn't argue, he didn't debate. He took solace in the word the utter dependence, in utter dependence on the fact that God had spoken. The minute he did so, the battle ceased. The moment Satan confronted with the word of God in context and saw Jesus was taking refuge upon the written statement of God, there no longer could be any struggle. This is very important. Our continuing struggle comes because we are so reluctant to take a stand, our stand, on God's revelation. We feel for the force of the devil's alluring lie that we will again, we will gain something by this action or thought or attitude that is tempting us. We think if we don't do this thing, life is going to pass us by. We're going to lose something. And if we do it, we will gain a hidden kingdom which is will be satisfying and a blessed experience. That is the force of the temptation. 